Shop Talk is back. With the support of LSETF, we're sat down with some young, brilliant entrepreneurs to learn the secret behind their success so that just maybe we can do the same thing. How are you? I'm very well. Very well. I'm actually incredibly jet lagged. I, as you know, arrived late last night so I could come, so I could make this meeting. Yeah. I decided to come back from America. I feel special. Mm -hmm. I brought you all the way back to the motherland. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's a good start. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> so you're very jet lagged, very tired. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And still you power through. That's I a good business through. ethic. I mm -hmm, like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so talk to me a little bit. Before we get onto the like deep end of stuff, mm -hmm. I want to know a little bit more about you. Okay. Um, if I remember correctly, you are a fan of like motorcycling. That's different. I don't motorcycle anymore because as you can see actually from this knee, um, I've got a lot of knee injury. Experience. On the yeah, an experience on my knee um, <laughs> from crashing my motorcycle a few years ago. And um, I, I more, or less, more or less stopped actively riding. Um, actually, no, I didn't stop actively riding there. A year later, I moved to Nigeria. And that's and when, it was just like, how am I going to do that? That was like 2014, 2015. Yeah. So what do you do now that you're in Nigeria and not most cycling? Mm -hmm. What do you do for fun? I get tattoos. Yeah, and, I was going to, uh, I was literally, I was ready to ask questions. I've seen about, <laughs> feel like, I've free. seen at least four. Yes, right? feel free. I, uh, no, I, I, my, my tattoo story is, um, Every time I learn a new transformative life lesson, like, you know, when you learn something and then it kind of changes your perspective on life in general. Yeah. Like when you realize like, you know, you win more or you get more bees with honey instead of vinegar or you like little things or whatever was transformative life, life lesson to you. That was one of mine. Okay. Um, then I generally get it tattooed. So I keep it front top okay. of mind. So let's talk through at least two of your tattoos. You okay. can pick them okay. and tell me the story that goes along with how mm -hmm. you learned the lesson. Okay, so um, this one says, Still I Rise. Okay. It's a, a quote from Maya Angelou. I'm named after Maya Angelou. I was going to be like, because I mean, I'd bantered about this already prior. I was mm -hmm. like, the name can't be accident. Can't yeah, be right. yeah. So my mom is in the military, 23 years, active duty, gunner on the top of the tanks in Iraq, like uh, war vet. Um, and, and she was uh, with her platoon. Um, and they had, I think they were doing some training in Germany or something. And they had entertainment for the night, and it was Maya Angelou. And she had just found out she was pregnant with me. And uh, my mom said from the time Maya came on stage until the moment she left, everyone in the audience had tears streaming down their face, all these big, tough military war dudes. And she's like, I wanted my daughter to be as powerful with words. And um, the second one is this tattoo. So I got actually, so I do, every year I do a Vipassana, um, a, a 10 day silent meditation retreat in. Cause I was going to be like, you just yeah. threw a word at me that I don't know. Yeah. So a 10 day silent is. meditation retreat. So <laughs> I got this one on my first one and then this one up the back, um, um, through compassion is liberation is what it okay. says on the back. And that means the only person that suffers when you hold on to anger or miscommunication or non-acceptance is you like, mm -hmm. like, uh, that I learned in my second Vipassana that through compassion uh, is liberating for the individual, more so than for anyone else. Okay. And then the first one are just three principles that I learned from my uh, Vipassana. It's equanimity, um, uh, awareness, and impermanence. Anicca, sati, and equanimity in the local language. You're a very intellectual person. I, I wouldn't say I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> okay, just, just you know, things are coming at me. Mm -hmm. So. Right off the bat, your... Oh, actually, I want to add my, my favorite one, my grandma's signature. That's a non-intellectual one. My grandma writes, love you loads, G&G &G, on every card I ever get. And it's, her signature is right there. Did you make sure they got the handwriting right as well? I literally gave them the birthday card. They traced the birthday card and then put it right there. Oh, perfect. Mm -hmm. Awesome. That's beautiful. So you said your mom was vet, mm -hmm. right? Is. Um, She's still alive. So I never know the way in which to coin this stuff. Mm -hmm. I wasn't trying to imply that she wasn't, because mm -hmm. I didn't know. Um, but, so what was growing up in, in that household kind of like, and what did you learn from that? Yeah, so so my mom, um, uh, I think I learned to sort of spit at shame from my mom. Like we, like, it's not a thing in the in the Horgan females. They don't really get embarrassed. They don't, they, you can't be ashamed. You can't be like, ah you're not being a lady, you're not blah, blah, and waltz, you yeah. know? And so like she, my mom's like blonde hair, blue eyed, Swedish Minnesotan, very like pretty, yeah. 
uh, all American woman looking. And that, with her long hair, then becomes, you know, joins, decides to join the military. Out of everything else, out of becoming a housewife, out of becoming, yeah. she decides to forge her own path and, and join the military. And then when she's home, she's an artist. So she builds these like 40 foot bronze sculptures um, and, and is a painter as well. And so interesting juxtaposition even between those two lives. So like she had her military friends, like tough, like we, yeah. I learned how to shoot all the different types of guns, like M16s in the house, AK-40, like I know how to shoot them all from a very young age. And, but on the other side, I also would spend days just hanging out in the studio, making sculptures out of clay or, or different materials, playing in the kiln or, well, you know, putting my things in the kiln, um, learning how to fire by myself and from, you know, as a, as a kid. Yeah. So, so yeah, it was interesting. Where does the, um, because you grew up in a very creative space, right? Mm -hmm. And also very, so I see creativity. Mm -hmm. And I see creativity in you generally. Mm -hmm. um, and you're very, very chilled down to earth. Where does the business person come out from? And how do you even get on the journey towards like, this is what I want to do? I, what frustrates me, so um, not frustrates me, but what I find curious um, is society's general desire to really categorize. So if you're this thing, then you can't yeah. be this thing. Or if you sit in this box, you can't also sit in this box. And I think I'm, I mean, even... It, what you'll probably learn about me is I'm there isn't really a box yeah. that that fits one thing. I mean, I'm a dancer, but at the same time, I love finance. Like I, you know, love English, but I you can put me in front of a spreadsheet and I can be geeked out and super into, you know, whatever we're working on. So, um, yeah, I wouldn't I wouldn't say there's a box. And I also would say the same for my mom, like at, on one side, you know, yeah. I, I, I'd say, I would say the common thread tying all this together and my dad's profession is committing yourself to something greater than you. Like my mom was in the military and then her art was, you know, to, to shed light on what was happening with society. Yeah. My dad's a pastor. And so I'm, I have a venture fund that's dedicated to, you know, transforming the next generation of African youth. And I'd say creativity is fundamental because yeah. it's not like there was a bunch of venture capital funds before we started ours in 2000, what, 2017, or I started my first yeah. business in 2014. We, we were literally there to pioneer the VC space. And it really does take a lot of creativity and entrepreneurship. Um, of course, there's a finance finance infrastructure, like similar to my mom, who's in the military and like, it's, it's rigid. It's not just hanging out, it's, you know, yeah. at war. It's not just, yeah, let's just do what we feel. <laughs> um, but at the same time, in order to even be able to see and pursue that path, the the creativity and imagination is is just a fundamental requisite like you must be able to think differently because we built it and, and so in that space right even just looking in terms of the vc space how much does um creativity play a mind in the business ideas that you kind of are more likely to be interested in um and how important is that sense of like innovation to speak about that how important is the sense of innovation in the VC space? I mean, it we invest, space, right? it is the VC is space. The VC we exclusively <laughs> invest in innovative and disruptive technology businesses. Yeah, I mean, we're investing in zero to one technology that like, like when we're looking at an, at an opportunity, our assessment, I mean, I can go over all the practical stuff, but as far as like con con in consideration of innovation, it has to be a technology that's like 10 times or, you know, a hundred times better than the closest alternative. So like you have your way of getting in the car and, and finding directions to your next location. If you were to adopt a new way of doing it, it'd have to be 10 times to a hundred times, you know, 10 times plus better than what you're currently mm -hmm. doing right now. And so in order to even like to come up with, they have to be disruptive, they have to be transformative in order to get the consumer or get the business to stop doing what they're doing right now and yeah. start doing something completely different to transform their way of life. And also keep their retention and engagement high. I don't want you to just do this thing once. I want this to be a part of your life now. So how do we think of technologies that are so great, they'll, they'll get people to change their lives yeah. to adopt them, and are so useful that they become incorporated into every day. That's you're, what we're looking for. Because you're looking at a lot of businesses in terms of people coming into the African space, right? Um, how, like, how are you going about, what are the thoughts tracks to how you actually because we're so culturally um, rigid sometimes mm -hmm. um, 
that how do you get to a point where you can say how like I'm going to affect this market enough to make sure the culture begins to change because tech faces a lot of challenges here. I'm not so no. I will firstly we don't. I'm and that's something that we wouldn't invest in if it requires people. So so I guess I I I, I need to sort of make an asterisk on on my last <laughs> what I what I said. If if main, a main part of the business requires people to sort of do things in ways that are not natural to them and they have to be taught and and they have to be strongly encouraged and and like pushed to do something different that's not like we want to go along with pe- the way people naturally mm-hmm. go about their lives like if you wake up every morning and have a coffee and then drive to work we're not going to say hey actually don't have a coffee anymore and stay at home mm-hmm. you know that like it's it still has to go along with your lifestyle but you have to be naturally incentivized to do this mm-hmm. other thing cuz it's so great does that does that well, difference make or does it, that I mean, it makes make sense it, and it helps it and, helps and so with 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 Nigeria specifically because we can talk about all of Africa but all of Africa and then I'll come down to Nigeria with all of Africa you know 1.2 billion people in in our target economies there's like 80% plus mobile penetration so like basically everyone has a phone and then within that 80% or within the whole population there's about 50% plus internet penetration and so you have people who are using phones everywhere across the country yeah. and you have people who are engaging with the internet on their phones like buying data regularly ser- mm-hmm. searching the web and so what solutions can you bring to individuals knowing their natural ways of life so like i'll give an example right now we know the naira has had problems we know yeah and so yeah, one day you have the comparable of a million dollars in your account the next year you have 500k the next day you have 100k you know yeah. and so this is this is a naturally occurring event and and then the consumer is going to naturally be looking for different ways to store their wealth. Mm. So this ne- this is happening in the economy, a natural progression. Right now, they might not be doing anything or they might be buying gold instead. Mm. But what but we're doing is we're saying or what what startups then would say is, okay, we see this naturally occurring macro and micro phenomena and we see people looking for other places to store their wealth so they're not explo- exposed to whatever is happening. Um, what how can we leverage technology to meet the needs of the population as it currently exists and as their demands currently yeah. exist. And for example, we have a portfolio company like Bamboo. You know, it's like the Robin Hood for Af- yeah. for Africa. So, it allows people to buy public equities in foreign markets and different places and, and it provides an alternative to storing wealth. And similar like Piggyvest, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, other companies. Yeah. And so, natural occurring hum- uh, phenomena in the market behavior, you know, consumers have a demand this solution is 10 times plus better than having to go find gold buy buy a bar of gold yeah. somewhere you know and, and but but at the same time it does transform the way they go about living their lives but in a way that they were already looking for so it meets a need that's not already being cur- or currently being met does that make sense yeah okay yeah. i'm following you like i'm it's you're here it's a you're bit work me. but i'm getting yeah. there i'm getting yeah. there right? so is- these are the types of companies that we're investing in or say you have a clothing business so 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 that's the consumer so consumer right. means you're selling to the individual um and then there's a business example it means you're selling only to businesses yeah. and for example like paystack our, our portfolio company that sold last year they looked and said okay so say you're a you have a retail shop you're selling clothes in nigeria yeah. and all and you can only sell cl- clothes to the people who come and give you cash on site because you don't have POS or you don't yeah. have an online platform. You want to buy on e-commerce but somebody has to make transfer to your account. It's inefficient, it, it gets confusing. Yeah. And then so you have something like Paystack where it's still the same activity. People go to your store, they engage with it, they want to buy something. It just makes the payment process more seamless. Yeah. So instead of having to transfer you and da 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 get in touch every time, they can just go on the website, put in their card information and the transaction happens automatically. Yeah. Same market demand, same everything. Just make it more efficient to do the things that people wanted to already do. What are you and can you be doing in terms of helping the the masses? So I'm looking at mm-hmm. like people that want to go into starting SMEs yeah. and things like mm-hmm. that. What opportunities are there? What kind of things are you kind of um, looking to see people kind of be creating? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, because we know there's huge unemployment numbers yeah, in yeah, Nigeria yeah. amongst the youth, right? And they're consistently looking for something to do, somewhere to go. And entrepreneurship seems to be the way because a lot of people can't find work. So they want to do things by themselves. Mm-hmm. What kind of things that, you know, the average man who doesn't have 
maybe some of the opportunities or the, fi- the financial capital available to him um, can be and should be doing in this space. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So, um, Ingressive Capital, we have, we have three businesses right yeah. now. We have the advisory firm, which is the first one that I launched in 2014. Yeah. That was because when I was 23, I tried launch, launching a $50 million fund and I, yeah. I didn't raise the $50 million. <laughs> so then I said, okay, instead of giving me the money up front, investors, I'll take you to Nigeria. I'll show you the investment, like the, the viable investment opportunities. I'll help you. I'll help support your portfolio companies. I'll help you make deals. Yeah. I did that for a while until they trusted me enough. Then we launched the fund. Yeah. And then last year, so we had the $10 million fund that we launched. And then last year, we, we launched Ingressive for Good. So for the masses, and this is just people who are resilient, hardworking, and want to learn tech. You yeah. don't have to have any skills in tech. You just have to want to. Yeah. And be serious. Um, I might join on to one of these. Sure. By all means, go to www.ingressive.org, I-N-G-R-E-S-S-I-V.org. And what they do is they provide micro scholarships. So um, they'll buy you a laptop. So if you apply and say, hey, I'm an African youth and I want to learn how to code, um, but I can't afford a laptop and data. See, here's my bank statements. Yeah. You prove that you can't afford it. We'll send you a laptop. We'll send you data for the duration that you need to learn whatever skills you want to learn. Yeah. And then we also sponsor... Coursera. Do you know what Coursera is? It's no idea. Okay, it's a platform. So, like all education institutions from around the world, um, they'll po- they'll post their classes on Coursera. So it's like as if you're sitting in like MIT's on there, Harvard, yeah. blah blah blah. So yeah. you can learn from the teachers. They record every okay. class yeah. and the assignments. Yeah. So basically, like Coursera and all these different accounts, all these different platforms, we sponsor unlimited accounts for yeah. students or for people who just want to learn, and so. And also university scholarships for, to study computer science. If you want to learn computer science, you can't afford it, we'll pay your tuition. And it also does technical training and talent placement. So not just giving you stuff, but also an actual, we're doing a 47,000 member technical training cohort right now to mm-hmm. learn to be a developer. And then we place the talent into jobs. University, micro scholarships, technical skills training, talent placement. 47,000 member technical training cohort we're doing right now. So what are the complications that are unique to Nigeria? when you're trying to do that, especially feeding into the tech space. Yeah, I mean, literally, you just apply online and say, I can't afford a laptop, I can't afford, yeah. I don't have power no, I, in my I house. Mean, I fully get that. So what I'm, pay what for I'm your... talking about is... That's a Nigerian problem. This, we're getting into the tech space generally. So beyond the individual's problem in the tech space, what problems are the tech space having, the challenges tech space Yeah, te- with... technical talent, qualified yeah. technical... So the reason, that, part of the reason we started this is because we were working with a client who saw there's like a 100,000 mem- uh, 100, people applying per cohort to Andela. Do you know Andela? Yep. Like they're a developer training school, yep. super competitive, da, da, da. They're like, there's 100,000 people applying each cohort to Andela. That was years years back. They're like, but we're a developer repository. We only have 2,000, 3,000 members on our platform. Why is that? Mm. So a bunch of people to, who have demand, or there, there's a lot of demand to be a developer, but on the side, there there's demonstration in the market that there aren't a lot who are actively coding. Like, what's going on? And so we went into un- universities and we're, we're doing market research, and we realized at all the computer science schools... They don't have computers. They don't have computers. And they're writing code on chalkboards yeah. with chalk yeah. until they graduate. Yeah. And that's the first time they write on computer when they can afford... Maybe. Maybe. Yeah. And they're using textbooks from the 80s. And we're like, this isn't practical. The ecosystem is scaling, but we're not going to have any talent. Yeah. And so the solution was giving laptops and just allowing people to learn whatever it is they want to learn online so they can start getting practical experience. So our technical training cohorts, it's literally just building stuff that businesses want. You learn, you know, there are ones on AI and machine learning and all this, that and the other. And so you learn key skills. You work on specific projects. You have to build specific things. So when you go to work or go to the job and they're like, we need this website created. We needed to have this sort of functionality or we need to build an app that does X, Y, and Z. Yeah. You've already had the experience doing it. Okay, so let's say we've got someone who's got the talent required and mm-hmm. a somewhat viable idea. What are the next questions you start asking to see if it's worth actually funding these people? Okay, so and then just again to clarify that the nonprofit is totally separate than the, yeah. the for-profit venture yeah. fund. So the nonprofit provides people with the resources and the access yeah. they need to start learning the VC fund picks the ones who, you know, got the skills, start scaling, and are ready to, to yeah. receive investment. So what we look for on the on the VC side of things, on our 10 million, and then we just launched the race for a $50 million fund too. 
what we look for. Don't viable. Don't let the tide get the best of you. Hmm? Don't let the tide get the best of you. I know. I was almost going to yawn. I'm not going to. <laughs> I will not yawn. Okay. Um, is po- you have to be in market. So mm-hmm. po- product market fit um, and, and post traction and in market. And that means you have a product, people are using it. And they're really liking it, which means there's strong retention. They're continuing to use it and they stay using it. Yeah. They don't just use it. They love it for a week and then they forget. You know, they stay engaged with it over time. Yeah. And um, and they're either purchasing or whatever is the action item to demonstrate that they're engaging yeah. and they find value in it. Whether it's just, you know, constant screen time or they actually have to pay for the product or whatever. They're engaging with that. And those numbers are the number of people who are doing that grows you know, over 30%, over 50% every month or, uh, you know, a lot every month. Um, you're also focusing on a, on a large problem. Like it's a billion dollar TAM, total addressable market. It means there's enough people in your core markets where you're, where you've launched your products or where you're going to launch your products, where you can sell billions of dollars of goods and you can have billions of customers on your, yeah. on your platform or, or, you know, million, tens of millions of customers on your platform, hundreds of millions. Um, we also look for technical talent in house. So you have to have a, if you're, if you're writing, if you're making a tech company, you have to have somebody who knows how to build tech. Yep. Um, and we also look for at least one local founder on the team. We want somebody who's, you know, grown up, who knows the, the, the customer demographic very yep. well. So like grown up engaging with them, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then somebody who has practical experience in the sector. So if you're building for financial services, have you worked in the space? Have you sold to the space? How, how do you, how, why do you know so much about this, the problem that you're trying to solve? Okay. So let's say you've got someone, cause I know that before you get to the point of investment, you said you want to have proof of concepts mm-hmm. and proof of the fact that people are engaging mm-hmm. for the duration of time. But I also know that in the tech space, um, it usually takes, um, a somewhat substantial amount of, um, capital before you get to the point of turning over a profit all mm-hmm. of a sudden. Um, and so what advice do you give to people starting out while they're still trying to prove, prove um, their concept, mm-hmm, prove mm-hmm. their idea? I don't need profit though. Like, I, it's okay. Yeah. It's okay. I mean, I, I definitely want to see you're generating revenue and you have a focus on profitability. It's not yeah. one of those sweet yeah. businesses that's <laughs> like, someday we'll make money. We have a billion users, but no money, you know, because... Africa's sexy right now. Every year there's a 2x in the amount of VC dollars coming into our ecosystem. Last year was billions, you know. It's sexy right now, but what happens in two years, something crazy happens and then all the, because 80% of VC capital funding businesses right now comes from the abroad. So what happens when they don't like Africa again? Yeah. And so I, I, I'm looking for businesses near term to profitability or low cash burn rate. Like their economics, their financials have to make sense as well. I want to scroll back a little bit because mm-hmm. you, I mean, I know what you're doing in terms of um, the non for profit and providing help for, all of, for people um, in terms of getting the equipment they need to learn how to do tech mm-hmm. and all of that. Um, but because you're also bringing up the idea of knowing your market and all that kind of stuff mm-hmm. and gaining experience, what role do we kind of have to play in improving the education system to the point that people can actually do all of mm-hmm. this without you having mm-hmm. to suddenly? Um, invest more time in simply backwards integrate ready, into yeah. the market because it's broken yeah. elsewhere yeah that's the thing about building in africa is you have to almost every business needs to have a parallel nonprofit because you have to backwards integrate to rebuild the infrastructure for the sector you're trying to operate because mm. everything's yeah. a, not a lot is broken <laughs> a lot needs help um me yeah, i i don't have time i can just focus on one problem at a time yeah. i can't be focusing <laughs> on trying to rebuild because the education I, I, system just because yeah. I, I keep thinking about right um you you talk so about Africa is sexy right now, mm-hmm. and truth it is. Mm-hmm. Um, but let's look at unique the unique um, circumstances of Nigeria, mm-hmm. um, and what is ease of business like right now, and in terms of attracting people to actually put the money <laughs> in Nigeria specific. Mm-hmm. And how do we? I don't think that? anyone's paying anyone's asking ease of business because if they cared about ease of business, mm-hmm. all the money would be going to Rwanda, all the mm-hmm. money would be going to Ghana, and yet. What is the key recipient of VC dollars in Africa? It is Nigeria. Yeah. You know, you're on your, what is the wealthiest black nation? The largest economy. It is Nigeria. And, um, and I think, as opposed to thinking about it as like, where is it easiest and where is it, you know, most amenable to FDI, foreign direct investment? We think about where's the largest market opportunity and ensure that there is 
mitigation of risk, as in to de-risk all the all of these problems, all the wahala, yeah. the main ones that could stop my money. We we have reasonable measures to mitigate those issues. As in for us, like what we need in the VC space, we need technical talent, we need entrepreneurial people, so people p- focusing on businesses and mm-hmm. starting them. We need funding and we need at least some stable regulation. Doesn't have to be great regulation, doesn't have to be helpful regulation, just mm, stable. Yeah. So we have, you know, we, we've built the business to backwards integrate and, and technical talent and, and helping people be entrepreneurial minded. Our, in our investment fund, 80% of our investors, we have like almost 40 investors, we have 30 investors, 80% of them run later stage funds. So we can get our own investors involved in our deals. So we'll always, even if Africa is no longer sexy, we at least have our base of investors mm-hmm. that can help our companies. What, what made you decide, what motivates you? Like what motivates you and what motivates you to come back to Nigeria? Mm-hmm. A few things. One, I grew up super poor in rural Minnesota, like trailer park, roof caving in, poor. And I was always super smart and very ambitious. And I found when I was young, like poverty is a prison. It's mm. like, mom, I want to do this. We don't have money. Mom, can I go for this, like this training class? We don't, we can't afford it. Mom, can I have milk? Not today. You know, like, no, there's so many walls. Mm. Even if you're capable, even if you're hungry, you know, even if you have the, the drive and the determination, mm. there's so many walls. And that access where like, despite being intelligent, capable, and, and, and know exactly what I wanted to, to do, there were access outside of my own control that, that hindered me from going at the pace or being able to start when I wanted to yeah. start. And I hated that feeling so much, I don't want other people to go through that. So that's like a huge motivating factor. And the other one is just my unrelenting confidence in an African, specifically Nigerian entrepreneur. Mm. The resilience here, the, the, the commitment, the just like a, a ability to choo-choo-choo-choo-choo. No matter what's nonsense, I won't say the word government, but someone throws at, throws at us, <laughs> no, no, regardless of the nonsense, yeah. just pivoting, you know, like put up this roadblock, we build around it, you know, just solving all of the problems ourselves. And, and I, 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 one, I can't ignore the opportunity. There's clearly a financial opportunity here. It's clearly Africa is now the, the, the growth, the like incre- exponential growth in tech startup growth in funding in the ecosystem, all that, you can't ignore these, this data. It is the time, the tech penetration, it is the time. But also just knowing the African, the Nigerian entrepreneur, and I don't care if the market is up or down, we'll figure it, we'll find a way. And so that, so, so I can't, I can't, I I don't, I can never give up on, on the Nigerian entrepreneur. I love that. There's two questions I want to ask based off of that. I'm going to start Mm -hmm. in America. You said you grew up very poor. Mm-hmm. Um, what was the straw that broke the camel's back, and how did things change? Uh, what 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 camel's back was breaking? <laughs> I mean, because circumstances eventually change. So what? Okay. Shifted that. I was like, Minnesota sucks. Being poor sucks. I'm gonna study really hard and be really smart and get out of here. But what shifted? Like, what effectively shifted? Where I got a full ride academic change? scholarship to college, and my school like. I like fortunately went to a a top liberal arts school in America and tuition entirely paid for books entirely paid for like sub like, you know, uh, semesterly subsidies to like help out with life. And that really put me on a great trajectory. And in order to do what you do, how much do you experience that somewhere like JP Morgan help you? I mean, I can name drop. There are, there is there. I, I strategically, in my in my college internship and my even high school internship, and then where I chose to go academically, it's strategically for the network and the ability to name drop. Cool, I learned a couple things. <laughs> like, like yeah, I, I mean, I did learn something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like critical analysis in, in undergrad Pomona College, definitely critical analysis and what it's like to learn while feeling safe. Because when you're super poor and trying to learn, like you're always distracted. But being in a place where like they covered everything, all I had to do is show up to my class. All I had to do is be there. Yeah. And the things, the, the space to just be and be learning while you can just, no problems. That, that provided a lot of 
thinking through big problems that then that then led to my convictions and my theses yeah. that allowed for Ingressive to start. You talked about the importance of having like an entrepreneurial mindset. Mm -hmm. You like the environment. You like the tenacity of Nigerians, mm -hmm. of people who will fight through the struggle. Mm -hmm. What other things do you think are core and key to having an entrepreneurial mindset? What defines that? Um, seeing the light before dawn. So you know, you know it's going to come. You know exactly from where. So I had like I was talking about African tech before it was cool. Back when it was like this this one needs to rest she's yeah. <laughs> there's something not right you know um back 2013 2014 like who was talking about tech then it wasn't a thing and um to have that unrelenting conviction um and just stay true like i really do believe that there was something quite divine like a divine purpose like i think we all every single human has their own divine purpose. And if, you're, if your professional world isn't working out, it's because you're not in sync with your divine purpose. Mm -hmm. And I think that, yeah, I think that opportunities unlock. I think that doors unlock um, when you allow yourself to find and fit into to what is your intended destiny. That's one, another entrepreneurial skill. <laughs> so finding your divine purpose and allowing yourself to pursue it. Um, and accepting it. Um, oh, so good the other, there, right? So being able to see the light at the end of the tunnel. Uh -huh. See the light at the end of the tunnel. Um, I would say also essential is knowing yourself. So deep, deep self awareness. I had to do a lot of like therapy, transformational coaches. Like my bookshelf is split into spirituality, finance books, and self self help, self development. Um, you can't be a good manager. Like like starting a company is all about convincing other people who are smarter than you to work on problems that you're committed to. Yeah. Um, and you can't do that unless you're good with people and unless you know where your strengths and weaknesses lie. Because even if you don't know what, you, so like, I know what I'm not good at. Like? A lot. <laughs> <laughs> there are a few things that I'm good at. There's a lot that I'm not good at. Yeah. Um, I'm not good at people management. I don't have the time. If I need to be talking to you every day, informing you, go. Like, yeah. I, I, can't, I need to only work, you know, my colleagues can, can vouch for this. It's very entrepreneurial. And no one's, no one's going to be looking over your shoulder. But I mean, also in that note, you need to get stuff done yourself. Yeah. Um, and, and also, I'm not a in the weeds problem. Like, I don't want to go on site and be dealing with the mechanics. I'm a big pitcher and I'm an executor and I'm a planner and I'm a hirer. But I'm not going to be over time. Like, I, yeah. I get bored, you know. And so I know that I have to have those people or the machine will never work. We will go nowhere. And... Um, and to have that self-awareness and, and to know the few things that I'm good at and a lot of things that I'm not good at and be able to work effectively incentivizing people properly and being kind, being like a com kind, compassionate person. You have to do the work to get there, yeah. to keep people along the journey because nobody wants to work with that, w with a mean person. <laughs> Words just came tumbling out. Um, so, <laughs> <laughs> so... I want to talk about the aspects of leadership in business because mm -hmm. right? you touched on that and all of that, the importance of being able to guide a team and lead a team and get mm -hmm. people to go with you. Um, what what do we need to think about when we're thinking about leadership in business mm -hmm. in terms of cultivating a team, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. like you said, and just other things that are important. Often people who have smart ideas and great business knowledge forget when it's time to actually run a business. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. One, grit and perseverance. So stay committed. There are some people. So I'd say then first, humility. Yeah. Grit and humility. Those two combinations. Because with, with, if you have humil humility but no grit, the first person, who's, the first naysayer is going to, you know, direct you somewhere. Yeah. And if you have the grit and you don't have the humility, you stay too committed to what your first initial, uh, your first idea is, and you you can't pivot. Yeah. And being able to innovate requires constant micro pivots and macro sometimes pivots. And what I mean by that is, you have an idea, you go to market, like basically starting a startup is you have a hypothesis as to like what could work and what yeah. people could want, and you go and market and you test the hypothesis and and a positive like a validation of your hypothesis is people use it, they like it, they pay for it. Yeah. If it doesn't work, it doesn't mean that the whole idea is all bad. It means maybe you need to adjust something or you need to slightly focus on a different demographic yeah. or maybe this is better in a different region or maybe you need to iterate on the tool in this way. And if you're too 
commit too like stuck in it's, 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 yeah. it's it's a consumer it's a consumer it's not my problem or it's, it's the staff it's not me and you can't accept these things and not take them personally or you can't be humble you your business will fail and so i think yeah humility grit and humility coupled together are essential self-awareness as i as i mentioned um knowing yourself knowing what you're good at knowing what you're not good at and then also like it's essential to have self-love um and what i mean by that is burnout is really real and starting a, a, a company starting anything is a lonely journey and people really underestimate and uh don't glorify the how essential it is to care for your physical mental and emotional self yeah. like i say it all the time your body is like a generator powering the machine if the generator if the generator back up then what's you know so so ensure ensuring that you have that you're invested like acknowledging the fact that you your professional self is a direct reflection of your emotional, spiritual, mental, physical well-being. So how do you do that personally? How do you balance yourself? Because you must be quite busy. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So. so every year I do an audit on my relationships, on my emotional health, on my spiritual health, on my professional health. And then I create a goal list that's in part based on what I need to adjust and update. Yeah. And then it's also all the things that I want to achieve, yeah. both emotionally, with my personal relationships, professionally. And then I build out. I have my, you know, quarterly goals that are based on that. I have my monthly goals, my weekly goals, and my daily goals. So I literally build out my day so that I always, every day in the evening, I have a space for building personal relationships. All my dinners, I don't, I typically don't ever, I mean, I'll make exceptions, but my, my day to day from 6 p.m. on is cultivating my family and my friend relationships done. Cause I know it's, a, it's essential for me personally to thrive if I'm nurturing healthy relationships in my community, you know, and, and multiple days a week, every morning I meditate for an hour. So every time I wake up, I pray, I meditate. Cause I, I know that it's essential for me to be ba balanced spiritually in order yeah. for me to perform well in, in the workplace. Every Sunday, totally offline, no phone, nothing. I just pray and I sit in nature. Cause I know I need one day a week away from my phone, not in that, just reflecting, ruminating. I can be thinking about business, but I can't be on my phone typing emails yeah. and just offline in a natural environment. It's funny how many times I've heard that from the conversations that I've had, that importance of having a day that you take for yourself mm -hmm. in order to be able to engineer being efficient for the rest of the week. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, I want to ask you a little bit about this is is great and i see it in your space and you can talk to how you do it now when we look at the man the people who are um trying to go into entrepreneurship and you know there's so much in how do i even survive and eat today how do you start to cultivate that work balance work-life balance mm -hmm. in that space where you literally are like again build it i literally build out my schedule and i just stick to it google calendar is my closest friend yeah. um in the more like I so one of course um, a lot of people in Nigeria have help and you know who look out um, and even if you don't like regardless of where I am I know I wake up in the morning and I have my rituals and my routine I know every day fruit and vegetable spread keeps and you know fruit vegetables and nuts keeps me healthy so I make a spread in the morning that's beautiful and it's my creative side as well I like add the edible flowers and make this beautiful thing and have my ritual routine with my Turkish coffee maker. Um, and then in the evening, I know that I have to have a protein. And so literally I'll put it in my calendar, the times when I'm going to eat, you know, if I'm intermittent fasting, you know, 10 a.m., last meal, 6 p.m. And literally it's built out. And with an entrepreneur, the less decisions that you can, that you have to make in a day, the more effective you can be in the ones, in the main and important ones that you mm. have to make. Just like the, you know, Steve Jobs and Obama wearing a black shirt, I have the same black shirt every day, blah, 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 blah. Just automating as many parts of your life as you can so that the essential parts get your undivided attention. Yeah. And you can also automate taking care of yourself. How, because I keep thinking, you know, with people always consider or think about entrepreneurship as something that if you're doing it, you have really like not that much control over yourself because circumstances can change and shift them or something can happen and take over the course of your day. How do you begin to, when things can happen any, from mm -hmm. any angle at any time, how do you begin to build in discipline um, considering, you know, 
maybe you've set your schedule like you've said you mm-hmm. said that in the evening i do this mm-hmm. but something has happened tragically that has to be taken care of and maintain that discipline. i think the discipline is setting the parameters and setting your boundaries and sticking to them because i find when i first started out aggressive i was working 18 to 20 hours a day for the first three years of the business and there was a part that was essential that was that required showing up but the other part of it was i was so scattered and all over the place I was wasting 80% of my time on stuff that did not matter. Yeah. And now I can work a reasonable, for, you know, my whole team works a reasonable 40 hour, whatever work week. And the hours where we do spend on work are hitting the bullseye every time. Before it was 99%, I don't even know where the <laughs> targets, I'm just shooting, you know, anything was a target. Yeah. But now just being so specific and 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 careful and spending a lot of time thinking about how I'm going to close, how I'm going to execute and get, and taking my time with relationships, with partnerships so that the processes can be seamless. And we don't, there doesn't have to be all these fires blowing up every day, you know, but, so, no, sorry. Oh, but I mean, it, there is in starting something, there always, it, there are fires, there is yeah. time to dedicate, but setting those parent, like if you answer the email, you know, that's why I also appreciate it. I learned my first 10 day silent meditation retreat. I went in, I had so much anxiety wouldn't you know the first three days i was like i just remembered i didn't email this person they're not going to hear back from me for seven days yeah. my business is going to explode everyone's going to everything's going to fail and i forgot to tell my team member that he needed to do this did it up came back 10 days later the company had moved on yeah. everyone was performing terf- perfectly well without me and for those who needed me i came back 10 days later and i was there yeah. nothing blew up and died and so just acknowledging if, if it's even 9 p.m to 9 a.m where you don't respond to emails, nobody's going to die. And the people that need you to respond every 30 seconds to the email, yeah. or else they're not gonna do business with you. You wanna do business with those kind of people? So so considering also boundaries for yourself in business. Who are the type of people you want to work with? What is the culture and the environment that you want to put yourself in? And then be filter for that accordingly. Yeah. I mean, just kind of touching onto that, you, you said earlier that your dad's a pastor, mm-hmm. right? So is mine. So am I. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, what role does ethics play in business for you? Oh, I, everything. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, leading, of course, like in the deals that we do and, and within our company, of course, you know, we have our own company ethics and, and, and guidelines in that. But everyone who works in the team, like kindness and compassion is, is so, people don't realize how important it is to mm-hmm. just be a good person. When we say we're going to do something, I know, I know this within myself, I can say this confidently, go talk to people who do business with me. They'll, you know, I, I'm very confident about the response on this. If my is going to do something, it's going to get done. Like we're integrity of word, honor, like compassion, respect, you know, kindness, yeah. the, the, how essential. And people don't realize this is also a differentiating factor in business. You show up with those things, 99% of those in market are incapable. Even if they wanted to, they can't because they still need to do the work inside themselves. And so to be able to show up just as a good person who can be, who people, who clients, who, you know, even, you know, peers and volunteers, they can rely on to tell the truth, to show up in a certain way, to get something done as they said they were going to do it. That's like, that's like a big thing. That's a big deal. And those are, you know, godly values as well. Yeah. I want to ask two more questions. And I'll let this mm-hmm. wrap up. First thing, I want you to tell me an interesting story or something, a mistake you've made, a lesson you've learned, something um, hard you've gone through that has made you that has made you strong as a business person. Hmm. I like when you have to think. Mm-hmm. There are many. I'm trying to think of which one I want to use. I actually have two. Okay. The first one is I've been fired from every hospitality job I've ever been hired as maybe like six. I was like waitress at Red Lobster. Uh, you know, I worked at a burger joint in New York. Um, I worked at a Thai place in San Francisco. Da, da, da. Um, and I was fired time and time again. Like even when I didn't want to be fired, <laughs> I was fired. And um, it taught me to stay in my lane. <laughs> that, um, And also to have deep respect like I, I, I think I under, underestimated 
how dynamic of a skill set someone needs to have in order to work within a corporate institution mm. and be able to follow the lead of someone else. Because me, I can't do anything other. If you tell me to do something, I don't feel like doing it, it's not going to get done. But some like it, it, the discipline and respect and humility required in order to take directions Direction from someone else yeah. and also keep your eye on the end goal and be able to act like, you know, hold it in now so you can get to that end goal. I respect people who can do that. It's not me. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you tell me to pick up your water glass. I don't feel like it's not going to be picked up. <laughs> and so, um, yeah, just understanding. And also my, my core skill, as in that also helped define. I was like, oh, I can do anything. I can, you know, work within this company. I can do this. I can be in hospitality. No. no. I have a very small set of skills that sit within a little box. And I'm going to do stuff within that small set of skills. And, and I really deeply respect people who can work within organizations and institutions and in those other spaces. So that humility, respect for, for those types of careers. Um, and the second one would be, hmm. I feel like that one that you thought of is the one I want you to say. So um, I was really obsessed with grades in college and I got, you know, A's and da, da, da. And then my senior year, um, I just was off. Like I just, I, I didn't want to be in school anymore. And this whole thing of I, I do what I want when I want and I'm not very good at doing things when I don't want to do them. Um, I, I really, I just went, I just went sideways. And I, my senior year, um, one quarter I got, I think a, a, C plus or a B minus in one of my classes. And the next quarter on my senior year thesis, the most important grade that you get, I think I got like a B minus. Wow. I feel maybe like a, these a, are the things that you're saying, like B minus. Or, or C, maybe like school. a C plus. But for, <laughs> for me, it actually really impacted my GPA. And I, at the time I was still considering, you know, going to law school. Yeah. And so that materially changed that senior year, those, that, that quarter materially changed my GPA and potentially prevented me from being able to get in, into law school or the law schools that I wanted to go to. And um, I was super devastated. And my, and my thesis professor, I was like so mad at him. And like, what is this? You just, ah, you know. Um, um, and his feedback was like, Maya, one, and, and is this as silly as this is? He was just like, grades don't indicate your your competence in the real world. Like some people suck at school and are good yeah. in the real world. And then secondly, like whatever, take what you got from this experience, like all is not lost. You did this, you did research here and you found something about yourself. And so take what you got and leave the rest. And I found that really interesting because, you know, there's something a majority of, you know, billionaire CEOs or, or billionaire founders never completed high school and never completed mm -hmm. college. And um, and within that experience myself, there isn't necessarily a strong positive correlation between performance in 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 school and ability to execute in the mm -hmm. workplace, especially as a founder. Actually, no, I don't want to use this one. I have a better one. I have a good one. <laughs> OK, um, when I first started out my business, um, I don't have a strong finance background. Um, you're the, you must be the assistant. Do you know the founder or do you know, you know, where's, where's the, where's the aggressive, you know, where, where is he, where does he live? And, and, and sometimes, you know, I just, I just feed into it and be like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I know the founder. Like, just give me your number. I'll put you in touch with them. Blah, blah, blah. Um, I am the founder. And, and so one, there was at the beginning, just sort of going along with the roles that I had to play in order to get to my end goal. But then I, I, I did that a little too far. So at the, at the first it worked, you know, for even a, for a while, even I'd have my dad, the pastor who knows nothing about business, come into pitch meetings with me and be like, oh, oh, guys here, you know, but I'm just I'm speaking on his behalf. He's so big. He can't talk. But let me do the negotiations. Let me I'll teach you the finance, you know. Yeah. And so I would be doing my deals just but I needed, you know, some a, a man, an older man to be in the room. And that worked for a while. But then I was like, you know, um, people keep asking me these questions and, and questioning my, my finance and abilities. I should hire somebody with finance background. And so I went out and I found somebody who had financial experience and hired him as my CFO. It was a male. 
And, um, and long story short, the relationship completely did not work out. I didn't get, get what I needed out of it. And also, um, it was a bad, bad, bad match. Um, and what I learned from that experience, like, and it, and I, it, 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 it wasn't good. I'll just leave it at that. And what I learned from that experience was one, it's not about the pedigree. Really, when you're figuring out the, the business relationships that you want, focus on the person and focus on their critical anal analysis skills and their humility and their ability to get stuff done. And then secondly, I realized like, just because society says you need to have a, a male in finance on your team in order to succeed in the venture space or whatever, me, I'm performing, me, I've raised the money, me, I have successful companies, you know? Mm -hmm. And so look at the data, look at the actual metrics of where you are relative to where you want to be and forget about how people have done it before. Yeah. So those are that, I think that one was my, my awesome, useful lesson. Awesome. Um, I always like to do this and end, end the conversation with this. If you can give three golden nuggets that you haven't said before mm -hmm. um, to people that want to go and start out in entrepreneurship. The first one I would say is stay committed to your destination and flexible in your journey. Your ways about getting to your path will change and do change. You will have to pivot. But just stay committed to the end goal, the whatever you were deeply committed to and whatever you had conviction in in the beginning. With us, it went from an advisory firm to a venture fund to a nonprofit. We always had the same goal of changing the next generation of African innovators, of providing opportunity to the next generation of African innovators. The second one I would say is do the work. Invest in yourself, read, get the books, see a therapist, you know, all the things that are taboo or looked down upon or not seen as cool, you need to invest in the unsexy side, in the spiritual, in the emotional, in the mental, invest in yourself, go through the trauma, heal that. Because if you can't show up for yourself, you cannot show up for your team. And if you don't know yourself, it will d different parts of you you didn't know you have will start shooting out and hitting your team members and it will only negatively affect your work. And the third one that's so important is incentivize people properly. There's this culture in Nigeria of trying to pay people as little as you can and not giving them ownership in the entity. Of course, structure it appropriately. Do one year cliff, four years vesting. Google it if you don't, don't know what that means. It's basically like give people equity, but, but over time, milestone-based equity. But make sure that you have people aligned with incentives that are the same as your own. You can hire a bunch of very smart people, but if you don't give them ownership, Will they care about the long-term success of the company or will they care about what their short-term success or, and goals are as well as just, you know, what they're getting paid? So make sure that you think about, make sure all of your partnerships, everything from your team members to the people you're working with to your business partnerships, you figure out every little thing, all of their goals, what they want to get out of it, and you make sure it aligns with your own so that it's sustainable. Thank you so much, Maya. I've actually really enjoyed this conversation and getting to know you because... Um... Very different to my expectations. Oh, really? Not Tell like what, what what were your expectations? So, <laughs> um, so my expectations. I just I was like, I'm gonna dress this way to kind of calm the conversation down mm -hmm. generally. Because when I was talking to Vanessa, she was like, she only does per um, professional stuff. She's not gonna answer any personal questions. Mm -hmm. She'll just be like, I'm not answering that question. Mm -hmm. so I was like, I don't know what attitude I'm about to get up in here, and I'm a very chill person. Mm -hmm. What's gonna happen? But very different very light, very calm, very energetic. Good to know you, Maya. Thank you very much. Thank you.